In today's video, I'm going to talk about carburetor sizing. Now, when you start talking about carburetor sizing, most people will trace out this formula that's been around forever. Uh, RPM times cubic inch displacement divided by 3456 equals carb CFM. Now, what this really is, is the mechanical ingested air by the size of a motor. You know, basically trying to figure out, well, if the volume of the motor is so big and it's going to go so fast, it's going to need X amount of air. And that seems like a good idea. The problem is that carburetors are not measured that way. CFM is not technically a universal term. Um, this is what I call mechanical CFM. That's the actual mechanical size of the motor at a given RPM. And you can figure out, like in a box, a cubic foot of a box, that's mechanical. Now, carburetors are actually measured on a pressure drop. And anybody that does a lot of flow testing on like heads or whatnot knows that you have to have a specific pressure drop in order to make sure that you are comparing appropriate numbers. If you check ahead at 28 and then you check it at 30, well, the 30 inch pressure drop is going to show more flow than the 28 inch pressure drop. That's why we have standards and that's why heads tend to be tested at 28 inches of, of, of water drop. And in the case of a four barrel carb, it's 20.4 inches. In the case of a two barrel carb, it's 40.8 inches. So even in carbs themselves, you have different pressure drops. That makes it really hard to try and use this formula because the carbs aren't even all the same way. And during the carb wars, I mean, during the, the time when people were really changing carbs, they would sometimes actually change how, what the pressure drop was. I mean, I have seen carbs that were tested at 22 inches, or, or I even saw one company that was, you know, testing at 28, because that's the way the heads were done. And, and that really confuses the matter because the same carb can flow a different amount of air. Now, in the case of like a 800 CFM carb, um, if you didn't do it at 20.4, now 20.4 is an inch and a half of mercury. But if you didn't do that, it'd be like 660 CFMs. If you test a 500 CFM two barrel, which is done at 40.8, but you test it like a four barrel, it's actually only 350 CFM. So that throws a, a glitch in the whole thing. So let's, before we get too far into that, let's talk a little bit about pressure drops. Now, when you're testing this stuff, it's done on a flow bench. And what, it's you, what you use is called a manometer. And the manometer is just a tube in a U-shape with fluid in it. And it's open to the air on one side, and it's, and it's hooked up to your vacuum underneath the carb on the other. And all it's doing is changing the fluid level, and you measure it in inches. And that's why it's always, vacuum is always in inches. Now, depending on what fluid you put in it, it can change how the manometer reads. Um, in the case of like your vacuum gauge that you put on the motor, that's usually done in inches of mercury. And one inch of mercury will, inch, will equal 13.6 inches of water. Now, we tend to use water or an oil that, that has an in-between factor, but that gives us, a, by going to water, you get a much higher resolution. You can see more fine adjustments and changes in the manometer. And that's why there's different things. And so you can't even just say, well, an inch is an inch is an inch. It depends on if it's an inch of mercury or if it's an inch of water. And so that's the first thing that tends to really confuse people is how was it tested? Now, for the most part, I'm going to talk about inches of water when I'm doing this. Now, I will agree that the inches of mercury is what you're going to see on your vacuum gauge. And 
some guys will look at a dyno when it's running and say, hey, you know, we dropped down to one inch of mercury. Or, and they won't probably say mercury, they'll say one inch of vacuum. Well, that's inches of mercury. Now, an 800 CF on carb, like I just said, if it's at one inch instead of an inch and a half like it's tested, well, suddenly its flow drops down to 660 CFM. So your 800 carb is actually very flexible as to how much CFM it can move depending on what the pressure drop across that carburetor is. That's why this formula really doesn't work. It doesn't work out. So if we look at a motor, if we look at just a basic motor, we'll look at why you get vacuum to start with. I mean, we all know that the piston descending forms a vacuum here. With the valve open, that forms a vacuum in the intake. That's the vacuum you tend to read on your gauge. That causes air to flow across the carburetor and move the fuel from the carburetor. Remember, part of what we need across the carburetor is enough pressure drop that we can pull fuel out of the fuel bowl. It's not being pumped. It's not being injected. This is a carburetor. It's actually done by a signal that's vacuum-based and pulls on the, the uh, fuel itself to make it move. And that's the basic principle of how a carburetor works. Now, the question becomes, how should we size this carburetor in order to feed the motor? You know, if we've already decided that this isn't correct, the question is, what are we going to use? Well, the first thing I'm going to talk about before we get into actual numbers is things that you're going to see on a carburetor. Because that signal is based on the flow through the carburetor, you can use that as a bit of a judge as to whether or not your carb is too big or too small. One of the things to keep an eye on now is if you have to go way up in jetting. You know, if the carburetor, you know, you got a Holly carburetor on it, it's standard jetting, it's supposed to be 72 or 74, and you're all the way up in the high 80s heading towards 90 going, can I go over 100? The question is why? If you're doing that, that means the little signal pulling the fuel out of the fuel out of the fuel bowl is not very good. That means the airflow through the carburetor is not very good. That means that the carburetor is too big. So if you're having to jet way up from what a regular carburetor jetting should require, then that should tell you that your carb size is way too big. And, and I've seen guys, oh, the, you know, this motor is really badass. It, it needs lots of fuel. Well, that's not how this works. Now, in the carburetor, there is a little bit difference depending on what size booster it has. Um, one of the reasons big carburetors, like an 800 Holly, way back when, had a drop leg booster, is that increased the signal to help it pull fuel at a lower air rate. And in today's carburetors, you also have an angular discharge booster that even does a better job and helps break up the fuel. Now, those are all things to help under low airflow. I'm really going to stick mostly to wide open throttle, you know, full tilt uh, airflow. Because if that's where you're trying to size the motor for or size the carburetor for, that's what we really need to talk about. Now, the other side is true also. If for some reason you're having to jet the carburetor way down, you're, you're down at 51, you're down at 47, we're asking, well, is there a smaller jet? Well, that's telling you that the airflow through the carburetor is too hot. You're not big enough. You're, you've got such a signal generated that you're just pulling all sorts of fuel in and you need to do something about it. And that's usually meaning that you're going up in carb size. Now, you can do like we do on the dyno. Like I said, there, there are a lot of times you'll see a, a, a dyno uh, video and the guy will comment, well, you know, I'm at an inch of vacuum, I'm at 
you know, about an inch and a half. Now, at an inch and a half, it might be kind of close, a wide open throttle. But you never really know. And so one thing you can do is try and gauge the carb size by where's your vacuum at. You can hook up a gauge to the carburetor itself and see what the plenum has in the way of a vacuum at wide open throttle. And that'll also give you some sort of idea on carb size. You know, if you're not getting down into that, you know, inch and a half kind of range, then the carb's probably a little small at wide open throttle. If you see it creeping up, especially with RPM, then that's also a good indication that the carb is probably too small. Now, if it drops to zero and sits there and stumbles and then you kind of get going and it creeps up to maybe half, well, the opposite's true. The carb's probably too big. And, and these things will help guide you as to what you're doing in tuning. I mean, if, if that vacuum reading is off, you may not be able to tune the carb to where you need to because it's off in size. It needs to be close to the right size. Now, like I said, in, in total CFM that the carburetor can flow, they're actually a little bit flexible. And the other thing that throws a wrinkle in the size of a carb is the plenum space itself. Now, technically, this is your airflow. This is the airflow that the motor is going to need based on you know what CFM this flows. Technically, the valve should be the restriction, though sometimes the intake is a little bit. And, and that's really how much air it's going to move. Now, in between, you sometimes have a plenum. And I say sometimes because on a lot of dual plane intakes, where it's completely isolated at the carb, and the runners basically come right to the plenum, you virtually have no plenum. And that is done in order to increase the signal from the carburetor. That's why dual planes tend to respond better at low RPM because it doesn't necessarily have that plenum. It also helps that they usually have a little longer runner, but a lot of it is about the plenum. That's why when you go up to like an RPM intake, you'll see suddenly it's got a notch in the plenum. Well, that's to increase the, sh the shearing. Instead of having a divided plenum where you're only drawing on half of that carb size, suddenly you have a full plenum space and it's drawing on the whole carb. And the size of that notch can control how much it does in that what I call sharing of the two sides. Now, the, the thing about plenum space is it's averaging what's going on. Now remember, we're working on a pulse that's coming up the intake. Now that pulse is controlled by the camshaft to a certain degree about the length of time that it's occurring. I mean, it's partially based on the draw of the piston, but it's also partially based on the length or duration of the camshaft. Now, that duration is shorter than the cycle on the motor. So what happens is the carburetor can keep flowing past the time of the hard draw on the runner. And that builds a plenum up. So the runner draws on the plenum, and the carburetor is just filling up the plenum. That allows the carburetor to flow over just a little bit longer time than what the pulse in the runner is doing during the draw. And the extra volume is pulled out of the plenum and it basically fills and, and drops and fills and drops with the carburetor continuously flowing. Now, because of that, plenum size plays into the size of the carburetor. This is why an open spacer will sometimes gain your power. If the carb is undersized, and you add a one inch open spacer and suddenly gain 10, 15 horsepower, well, that's partially telling you that the carb is probably a little undersized because you added plenum, you added more area for averaging, and you might have gained the same sort of power with a slightly bigger carburetor. 
So it's one thing to keep in your head. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to change the carburetor size, but it makes you aware of the fact that, hey, you know, I'm actually a little undersized on this car. Now, at part throttle and low throttle, a little small car can sometimes help you out, and it's better behaved because that airspeed gets up faster. But we're talking about wide open throttle. Now, the same is true as if you put a big intake on an engine that really isn't going to draw all out. Sometimes you can go a little smaller on carb size. You have the averaging in the plenum, so the power will actually still be there, but the smaller carb helps it respond better because you don't have this big plenum. That, that's like I said, on a dual plane, you have that isolation and you have that very small plenum to help the response time. You don't have a lot of averaging. And you go to a single plane intake, you have more averaging. That's why a lot of times they work better at higher RPM than lower RPM. Is a lot of guys tend to over carburate really small motors that might have a dual plane on them. And they tend to sometimes under carburate bigger motors that have a single plane on them. And that extra plenum space will help them deal with the fact that the carburetor is going to be a little small. So that's some of the things you can look for when you're dealing with the carburetor and tuning the motor. Um, it, it comes down to listening and looking at what you're seeing. Now, if I talk about numbers, you know, the, the question becomes, okay, that's all fine and good. If I'm tuning, I can kind of see what you're talking about. But the question is, you're building a motor from scratch. What size carburetor do I need? Where, where do I start? So you need some sort of basic number in order to get going. And what I came up with years ago, and it, it's held very true, and it's going to seem like a little simple of an idea, but sometimes simple is better. Now, carburetors are based on a pressure drop. And when we test intake runners, they're based on a pressure drop too. So suddenly we have two things that are working on the same basic principle instead of working on something that's mechanical. And so in a four cycle motor, in pretty rapid succession, you have four cylinders drawing on the plenum area or the carburetor. And then the next rotation of the motor, you've got the other four drawing on. So at any given time, you have about four times the runner flow that is pulling on the carburetor. So if we say it's four times the runner, and say, in this case, we're just going to say 200. You know, that's 200. 200 CFM. Now, the drawback is this CFM that we measured in here, like I said, was based on 28 inches of vacuum drop. That is how we test uh, intakes. That's how we test uh, cylinder heads. That That's the industry standard. And if somebody's not using that standard, they're wrong. They need to all be the same number for us to all be able to compare things. So if this is 28 inches and the carburetor is 20.4, our four number is actually not correct. Because four is based on the number of cylinders, but the 200 is based on 28 inches. So to get it down to a carburetor size, what I do is actually 3.38 times 200 CFM would give me my carburetor size. Now, all I did was I take the four and the conversion factor to get me from 20.4 up to 28. So basically, I'm converting the four so that it's a single number I can use. And this is now based on the flow that will be in the runner at 20.4 inches of water. And so 3.38 times 200 would be uh, 
676 CFM. So in the case of this cylinder head, we would have 200 CFM and we'd need a carb that's around 676. Now, remember, carbs, like I said, are a little bit flexible. This number is not set in stone. Some depends on plenum size. You know, some depends on how the motor is actually going to get used. Um, but this is close. You know, the, the, the carburetor can flow a wee bit more. So in this case, I would probably run like a 650 carburetor. And that would get me pretty darn close to what I'm doing. And it tends to run pretty well. And I've used this for years, and it gets you pretty close to what the, the motor is going to want. So a couple of things to remember is that the CFM up here is not the peak CFM. If you have a head that flows, you know, 400 CFM in an inch lift, but you're only putting a 600 lift cam in it, well, that's not the CFM you're going to be using. So you need to look up the head and, and see what the CFM is going to be at basically the full lift of the camshaft. So if you're at 500 lift and it's flowing 200 CFM, this will work out. And, and if you're running a stock head, you're saying, well, I don't know what the CFM is. There is a website online uh, under the name Stan West, and he has all the flow numbers for iron heads and ported iron heads and some aftermarket heads and heads Weingartner has done and heads that, that uh, Dart has done. And he's got a pretty good listing of flow to get you to kind of ballpark that. And that's all we're trying to do here is kind of ballpark what we need in the way of a carburetor so that we're not way off in left field. Now, one of the other things is, like I said, the camshaft can technically control how much of that CFM you're going to use. On like an OE motor, a factory motor, 200 degrees of duration or so, you're really only going to use maybe 85% of that flow because it's going to, the camshaft's going to cut it off short. That's why putting a bigger cam in gives you more power is because it opens up the length of time and you get to use more of that flow. And plus sometimes it gives you more lift so the flow number's higher. But the timing is part of what I'm talking about. So if you really had to, if it's gonna, you know it's gonna be stock, you could undershoot this even a little bit more and get a better number for what's gonna run. Uh, but if you get up into kind of race stuff where you're actually trying to, to make sure the carb is right, you know, the basic number works out pretty close to where you're going. And so I know that's a very simple way of looking at it, but you almost have to be simple because the carburetor has that flexibility. Um, they will work in a certain range. They're, they're designed to work in a certain range because you've got part throttle conditions, you've got half throttle conditions, I mean, you've got all sorts of things where they still have to meter fuel. So they're designed to be more flexible. In fact, some of the newer carbs, where we used to say the carb had to be at an inch and a half of mercury in order to function correctly, um, a lot of the carburetors now will actually function well at like 0.6 inches of mercury. They, they've done a real good job. Now, sometimes, like I said, that's booster based. So in something like an angular discharge carburetor, you can get it to where it will run at a little lower vacuum. That means you could go a little bit bigger and it would still be well behaved. Now, you're asking why would you want to go bigger? Well, you can get a slight density change if you can get that vacuum down low. Now, ultimately, the limit of what the, the motor's going to make is the CFM that's going to flow through this intake and head. That is really what's going to make the basic horsepower. That's why we work so hard at trying to make better intakes and better cylinder heads and porting cylinder heads and bigger valves. That, that's all about trying to get better flow in here to make more power. 
Now, of course, that will raise your RPM band, but if you notice, I haven't talked about RPM at all. This is just a basic number based on flow done the same way that carburetors are tested to get you in the ballpark of what you need in the way of the size of a car. And, and like I said, this is not set in stone. You know, if you have a pretty big plenum, you could go lower than this. If you're running a dual plane, you might want to go up to like a 700 or a 750 because that split is going to reduce the plenum and it's, the carb actually is going to need to flow a little bit more. So you still got to think about kind of what you're doing, but this is the starting point of where you want to be for figuring out carb size. And like I said, I know this is really simple, and you could certainly figure out something different if you're running a straight six or if you're running a, a four cylinder, you could come up with a different number. This is V8 based because it's you know four cylinders that are drawing and then just converting the factor. So there are other numbers you can put in here if you're not building a regular V8 motor. Now, that's all I tend to build, so this is the number I use. Um, and that just kind of, like I said, it gets you close. It, it's way better than this mode. This number is. I, I mean, this number, it doesn't even get you close. You, it's, I've seen motors on the dyno, and, and this is another thing that can show you that the carb size is wrong. Um, dynos are pretty friendly about overcarbing. If you go too big, because you're at wide open throttle and it's full load and it's full tilt, you can actually overcarb a motor and it makes the same horsepower. And I did back to back tests. Um, a motor that really only needed like a 750 carburetor, and I knew that because of my formula, we started out with a 950 carburetor on it and it ran great. And I said, well, it really only needs a 750. And so we ran it, we dug out a 750, and we ran it with the 750, and it made within one horsepower of the same motor, of the same number as the 950. And so one of the guys like, see, it doesn't, the carb size doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter on the dyno, but a 750 carburetor is going to be way better behaved out on the street, hard throttle, low throttle, getting going, than a 950 carburetor will be. And so that's one of the things that can trick you on a dyno about carb size. I mean, if you're just dyno testing, just trying to get the number, you know, ultimately, like I said, the restriction is here. This is what controls the power, not necessarily the carburetor. The carburetor is really about metering the fuel. And at wide open throttle, it's really not a hard job for it to meter the fuel because you've got a lot of air going through. But at other conditions, that's not true, in which case you want to run something that's a little smaller. And so that also shows you that that little smaller carburetor isn't going to cost you in a horsepower if it's a properly sized carburetor. And like I said, I knew what size it needed because I used this number. And I knew what the head flow, I knew what the motor was. And so it wasn't hard for me to figure out, hey, you know, that really only needs a 750, not a 950. And it worked. I mean, it showed that that could make the same horsepower without overshooting the size that the, the car or motor needed. So that's one thing to think of. The other thing on the dyno that sometimes you can see on carb side if you ever see a, a, a dyno run and it goes just dead flat in torque, you know, it comes up, it's making 600 foot-pounds of torque, and it makes 600 foot-pounds of torque at the end. You know, it's, it's basically a dead flat curve. That is one indication that the carb may be a little undersized. You're basically moving the restriction from here, where it should be, up to the carburetor because the carburetor is undersized. Now, sometimes that can be a help. If you've built a motor that is too ratty, it's just too hard to drive, one of the things you can do is undersize the carburetor. You know, you look up your number and then you'd shoot down to maybe even a 500 CFM car. And that may ultimately cost you a little bit peak 
but that'll help the low speed power and the mid range and help it respond better. But you're essentially got to be aware you are moving the restriction from the valve where it's technically supposed to be up to the carburetor in order to drive the airspeed up and make it behave itself better. But those are tricks you can understand. And, and even this number at that point will give you an idea of how big a carburetor do I really need. And, and that's true of big motors too. Like I said, one of the biggest mistakes I see with really big mountain motors is they can't get a big enough carburetor. And they don't always see it. And, and I run a simple number and I can go, well, that 1200 CFM dominator isn't big enough. It really needs, you know, 14 or 1500 CFM. And, and so that can really quickly kind of help you gauge where a particular problem may be in the motor. So anyway, this is how I find carb size. And I find it way better. As far as I'm concerned, this does not work. And, and I, I don't understand why it's everywhere. I think it's just people confusing the fact that it says CFM and uh, carburetor is based on CFM and, and they think it's a universal number and it really is not. You know, this is mechanical CFM. This is all based on flow testing. You know, and, and I could make an 800 CFM carb flow 1000 CFM if I change the pressure drop up. So, like I said, that's part of the reason carbs have such flexibility. So, anyway, that's my take on carb sizing. I hope this number helps you. Remember, 3.38 times the CFM of peak valve lift will give you the CFM of the carb close enough that you can kind of make a good judgment call from there. So, anyway, that, that's how it goes. That's how I do it. And it's worked really well for me. I hope it helped you out. Talk to you later.